Seven. Seven. Give me just a second. Oh. Oh. There's Donna. There's Donna. It works. I found the shutter key. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> no problem. I'm here to help. Okay, that's right. We're ready to go. Yeah. Good evening. We'll call our meeting to order. Moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, that this meeting be open at 7 p.m. All in favor? Carry. Next, we have the adoption of the agenda. Moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, that the agenda presented to Council and dated the ninth day of April 2024 be adopted as prepared. All in favor? Carried. Any disclosure or pecuniary interest? There are none. We we'll move forward. No presentations or delegations. Next, we have the uh, staff reports. We'll ask for a report from our CAO for the Bonfield Medical Center renovation. Okay. Um, so this is a update from the March 26th council meeting where we did um, indicate that we were going to go for a tender onto the medical center for the renovations that we need for the allocation of a second doctor. Um, so the renovations are essentially to create and equip another exam room and the re reception area um, in discussions with the CBO for the township um, and a review of all of the project details that were needed. Um, the deputy clerk and the CBO did meet on site and they reviewed everything from that. From that conversation, um, he recommended that we go to a time and material um, process instead of a tender because the, the plumbing was in the ceiling and it's the floor and the ceiling between the pharmacy and the medical center. So we would have to have open holes while we were investigating to do a tender. And then, um, so he said, our project is very minor uh, and our, our scope, and we don't have the details to be able to put that into a proper tender form. Um, so he recommended time material from that staff contacted three general contractors to obtain hourly quotes and material costs. Um, there's a tight schedule to have the work completed, um, but uh, there were, um, of the three that were contacted, two did do a site visit and only one submitted um, a quote and agreed to take on the job. So DESCON is currently doing the renovations at the medical center. We hope to have that completed by the 19th of April. Um, the office, uh, the medical clinic is closed while those renovations are happening uh, because you can't have a construction crew while there's patients and they're visiting their doctor. Uh, but the office manager is still on site taking um, emails, phone calls, and reviewing the lab reports so that she can keep in touch with the doctors. Um, and when the doctor is there, there is no construction crew on site. So they're working it out and uh, we hope to have it done. Yes. Thank you. Any questions from council? No. no. It's good. It was a good report. Mm -hmm. Everything yeah. is there. Yep. So next we have a motion, right? Moved by Councillor McKenna, seconded by Council Featherstone. The council hereby agrees to move the Bonfield Medical Center project forward under a time and material basis with desk on construction. All in favor? Carried. Oops, my pen quit working. Okay, next we have um, the report from the CAO, Chief Building Official. Thank you. Um, so this report is uh, a follow-up. As everyone knows, our Chief Building Official retired in December of 2023. Um, we did do recruitment. Advertisements were locally, provincially, and nationally, and we did not have... Um, uh, any qualified um, applicants in for the position. Uh, we had hired um, as a standalone contract, a temporary CBO um, from our neighbor, Shane Conrad. He's been in, he's getting very busy with his 
regular position. <laughs> so um, time is of the essence for us to come up with a plan on what we are going to do. Um, we've still not um, hashed out what that what what we need to do. Um, so since that time, we and hiring Shane as a standalone contract, we have entered into an agreement with Papano Camera and Kelvin and Madawan for CBO services as required. Um, but that agreement is to temporarily assist and we still require to have um, and recruit for a CBO. Um, it's not a shared service agreement and uh, we could ask if the municipalities to activate that agreement and that agreement is $80 an hour. So whether it's us that needs them or they need us, it's an $80 an hour set fee in that agreement. Um, alternatively, we've also entered into an agreement with RSM Consulting for a large building project that late in December of 2023. Um, that is going well, um, and they're willing to provide additional services for small buildings and continue on with uh, large buildings, um, should we not have anyone successful in the role. Uh, so they sent in their standard municipal proposal. It's enclosed in here and what those fees look like. Um, they can provide the services through an online portal for uploading the required information for the permits um, and perform inspections either online or through pictures. Um, just because pictures might be necessary because there's some locations that don't have cell reception and or internet, so they would be able to do it through Zoom or Teams. Um, in order to streamline the services with RSM, they also require us to purchase cloud permit software. Uh, and that is $6,400 um, a year. Um, it was already planned in the budget um, previously in 22 and 23. Um, it was just not purchased. Um, at the time, there wasn't as much of a need for it. Um, with RSM, there would be. Uh, to be clear, the service is offered through the building department and will increase in cost, regardless if it's RSM or if another building official comes in. Um, and the true cost of RSM services will depend on the applications submitted. So how complete they are when they're submitted, how many applications, and then what those applications are for. Um, and uh, the province also has offers uh, internships for building services, and I do want to explore that more as well. Um, but that will take time in order to get somebody in. Um, yeah, so RSM will still be necessary, even if we do get a, a candidate who does come that just has small buildings. Um, but so each municipality in Ontario must appoint a chief building official. Um, so there's not an option to do nothing. We have to do something um, because we don't have a, a chief building official who can do part three or part nine, large or small buildings or homes. So we can continue to investigate sharing the CBO position with other municipalities outside the immediate area. Um, we did try this when we were first in, um, when we were first told that our CBO was going to retire. Uh, and then we did, um, we can continue to act or activate that agreement with Papineau, Cameron, um, Kelvin and Mat Matawan um, until we do find a, a candidate. Uh, or council can extend the agreement with RSM for building department services for the proposal. And that's one that we're recommending um, during the cost analysis that uh, I think that because we don't have a staff currently in the position that we can continue with them and the fees would still cover the cost of having RSM in. Uh, it is more technical. Um, I guess there's more technology involved in it in, instead of bringing paper into the office. Uh, but RSM does do a complete building department service, um, and they would still do that even with those large buildings. That's it. Okay. Any question? So, if we went with RSM, we would have to provide a staff member to go to the buildings. No. No, so originally um, we did do that and right. our um, temporary CBO um, did and, right. and he evaluated as well. So between RSM and his evaluation, he did feel that it would be fine for just the property owner to do those um, investigate with the inspections. Because they're guiding him where to yes. you know, shine the camera or point the camera and stuff, right? Yeah. 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 And if they don't put it where that is, then it, they won't complete the inspection, right? Right. So. So there's no extra cost. It's just the uh, the software, right? Yes. And then the eighty dollars an hour for a shared. Then we have to pay kilometers on top of that. Also, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. So are you saying 
on on top of our fees, the the cost to issue the building permit, then any additional cost of theirs uh, of the consultant would be the responsibility of the applicant. No, so our permit fees, which is the next report, but our permit fees, that is all that the applicant um, is charged. All the other fees and, and the cost of having RSM or having Pathno Cameron, um, their CBO if they, if, for him to come in, all of that is just our cost as the municipality. The applicant still only gets one permit. Fee. Okay, okay. You have any questions? No, that's great. No. That's Donna? Uh, no, I think we have to, uh, we have to get the software anyway, right? So. Okay. Moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Council Featherstone, that Council hereby agrees to continue the agreement between the Township and RSM Consulting for Building Department Services as required as per the proposal submitted. All in favor? Carried. Next, uh, another report from our CAO, user fees and building permit fee review. Thank you. Um, so staff presented a report in February of 2024. Um, and from that meeting, we could start working on updating our user fee bylaws. Um, so as part of updating that, just to go with the last report, um, the user fees on the building permit, um, we conducted a third party review. Um, I don't have the expertise to know how many inspections are done per um, in permit or how long it takes. So I did have some help with that. Um, so that report is in here as well. Um, we based the review on the last five years of permits and department costs. So we took the budget, the actuals and the budgets, and we looked at the permits that were issued over the last five years. So whether they were single family dwellings, commercial or um, accessory buildings, and that provided us a good overview to determine, you know, the requirements for how many inspections are typically required and, and how long they take. Um, we don't have a staff to do the full review. There's no staff on site to actually like go out and okay, I was on site for this long. And so that review, it's, it's not a full review. It's based on industry standards for how long inspection takes because we need to have anyone to do that with us. Um, so that's how we did determine the proposed costs. So as user fees are meant to be cost recovery, the report attached has two options. There's option A, which is full cost recovery, and option B is at a 70% cost recovery. Um, as an example, in 22 and 23, which were record years for our permits, uh, the number of permits we had, the department fees were 52% cost recovery on the fees as of today, which were passed in the bylaw of like 2019, which was updated in 2017, but not substantially. So our, our fees do date back to 2010. Um, so currently department costs are simply added to um, the tax levy and are factored into the overall surplus and deficit. If there is a surplus, um, we are mandated to have a billing reserve. Um, the province does require that we put any um, additional or surplus from a building department into reserve that offsets when we have deficit years because there's not enough permits um, to cover the fees. Therefore, it's recommend, uh, well, to move to full cost recovery immediately um, will be a heavy influx of fees and would put us outside the averages of our neighbors <coughs> in permit fees. So therefore, we're in the report, it's recommended to go to option B and strive for a 70% cost recovery. Um, once council receives the, the draft user fees, um, then a public meeting must be held um, for ratepayers to add input and comment on the proposed fees, and that's a 21-day mandated notice period. Um, so we do have that posted up so that we uh, can get the public in to have the input and bring this back on April 30th. Um, but as an example, in all of the user fees that are presented in the bylaws further down on the agenda, um, we did look at the comparables to our neighbors. We looked at um, as much as possible, the cost recovery. We have a new um, planning agreement with Tulloch and there's fees on there. So planning is typically, most applications are a, a set fee for what it's gonna cost for the municipality. And then any fees above that are, um, are brought to the applicant and then we invoice them and we collect them. But we do ask for de deposits on some of them. So 
we can make it um, easier on the applicant. Absolutely. When it comes to the building department fees, um, on page 15 of the report, just to give an example, um, so the if we look at group C, which is about a quarter down the page, um, for a new single family dwelling, under our current 2010 fees, the fee would be um, the permit fee would be two thousand and ninety dollars. If we went full cost recovery, it would be seven thousand one hundred and sixty two dollars. And under option B at 70% cost recovery, we're looking at $5,062. $5, um, so you can see the vast difference between 70% cost recovery and 100% cost recovery. That's one of the uh, five our recommendations. <coughs> um, for additions and alterations for a residential, um, under our current fees, it's $836. Um, option B would recommend that go up to $1,200. Uh, a demolition permit right now is free of charge, but still does require some work. Um, so we are, um, you'll see most of the flat fees in option B are set at um, $400 as a flat fee. That would be the demo as well. Accessories are the number one permits that we do <laughs> get um, here in Bonfield for accessory um, structures. So the fee right now is $371. And we are recommending it go to 500. So in under option option, <coughs> so I was quoting from the end of the end of the chart, and in the middle of the ones right next to it, you'll see there's a minimum fee, and then some of them do have a fee per square meter. So in option B, it would be recommended whichever one um, I believe is the highest, and that's the one that we would charge. So okay. Um, I, I just want to make a comment. Um, I know that it that we are far below the the average or what we're allowed to be, um, <clears throat> and I just wonder: our premier are saying to the municipalities that we shouldn't be increasing our fees uh, with respect to the housing. Um, I just wonder if any council member has a comment with respect to that or um, because of the the need for housing uh, like I'm okay with the increases but I I just read where he's asking the municipalities not to increase to make it difficult for the people uh, more difficult I know that the building materials have they have gone up and increased in prices probably double as to what they were in maybe two years ago. And uh, I don't want to think that maybe we're making it difficult for the, the people building. So, okay, sir. Uh, my only comment would be if Premier Ford actually wanted to take the inability for the municipalities to actually raise revenue in a different way uh, and perhaps even flow an additional funding into the municipalities to offset the cost, the real costs that we face, I'm all in. But it's pretty easy for him to stand to the side and say, yeah, please don't raise your fees when we're looking at real costs uh, that we have to absorb. So it frustrates me a little that the premier can just, you know, say that when in fact he also is the person pulling the strings on the other side. We are a creature of the province. So, you know, he... Uh, ties their hands in multiple spots. So uh, I don't give that a lot of credence when the premier is out saying that. What I would say is um, when it comes to our fees, obviously, you know, it is a fine balance between wanting to ensure that we're incentivizing uh, buildings uh, and uh, people and construction within our uh, within our municipality, as well as finding the balance on accessory, build accessory buildings and decks, not to disincentivize somebody to try and hide the fact that they're building a deck. So that's the that's the fine line that I walk of trying to uh, determine what our fees should be. So, and I think our fees were so out of date that, uh, I mean, <clears throat> like, I mean, it's not feasible for us to keep them there either. As long as everybody's good with them. Yeah, I, um, I'm I'm good with. I, mean, I don't think we're hiding anything or trying to hide anything. We are yeah. open and transparent with our true costs. So, 
uh, you know, and seventy percent, I think, is reasonable. We're not going after one hundred percent. So, and I mean, if we ever do get a building inspector, I mean, someone that's got to pay his wage. I mean, everybody's yeah. So. yeah certainly, we're allowed to have the cost for um, our expenses, but and minus not to indicate in any way that we're we're trying to hide anything. I'm just asking the question: what council thinks of it? That's yeah. all. I think CEO Conco has something to say. Maybe to tell me not to be so mean to the premier. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I agree. I okay, agree. very good, very good. In so <laughs> many ways right now that we yeah. can't generate revenue. Right. But user fees are for those who, I, I mean, with, I feel like I'm a broken record when I keep saying this, but user fees are meant to cover the cost for people who use a service. So right now, because our fees are so low and we're 52% cost recovery, that means it's covered through taxes and the entire population are paying for the building permit or, or the building services, but only a fraction are using them. And, and that's a whole essence behind user fees. So I know I'm a broken record about it, but going from a 50 to a 70% increase is it, you know, I agree with Councillor Clark that it's not like a hundred percent is unreasonable. I completely agree. Um, yes, in addition, and then I'll get off my soapbox. If we could actually see an assessment growth happen yeah. because of the work that people are putting into their properties, that in fact they could get reassessed, and then we could actually see, you know, the fruits of that coming back, and then, you know, more taxes because of higher assessment. But the premier has also frozen that for us. So, <laughs> okay, punchy tonight. Apparently. I rest my case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone. The Council hereby receives and appro approves the first reading of the draft user fee bylaws for Municipal Department. And that, I thought maybe I skipped one, but 16. I didn't. <laughs> and that a public meeting be held at the next regular Council meeting on April 30th. 2024 to obtain community input into the proposed fees and further that option B of the building permit fee review be accepted. All in favor? Carry. Next, we have, um, we're going to call on our public works manager with respect to the street sweeping. Thank you. Um, so as council knows right now, we currently don't have the equipment to do street sweeping in house. So, uh, two quotes were obtained from two local companies, one being TZR, the other being Dava construction, um, for the street sweeping tender to get completed before the May long weekend. Um, both companies came back, uh, Dava came back at $150 per hour. Uh, TZR came back at $170 per hour. Um, the recommendation put forth was to go with TZR uh -huh. contracting for the purpose of the street sweeping as past reports have shown that the other company um, failed to complete the job to standard in the past. Any questions of Alan? So I see it will be roughly $7,000. That's an annual fee. It's $6,800. Uh, that's $170 an hour at uh, 40 hours of sweeping. And uh, not to get too far ahead, but if we were, what would it take for us to have our own equipment and how much would that cost? Um, so essentially, I've been looking at that in relation to the equipment report. Um, the, I don't have any quotes yet on a sweeper, but I uh, will say that if we did have one in-house, like this could almost already be done by now. Right. Um, and I'll tell you right now, the cost to do that will not be $7,000 each time. So. Yeah, I think if we could build a case, and it probably won't be for this year, but if we're looking ahead to our uh, our capital management, you know, looking at our rent return on investment. So if it's $7,000 annually, how many, like, and it's $21,000 for the piece of equipment. Well, it's paid for itself in three years. Have you is, been shopping for them? Because that's right, is that around, a, right around the ballpark. Really? No, I haven't been. That was a, <laughs> just a shot in the dark. Yeah, if you could present that back in a report, like, uh, you know, 
So yeah, it might, it might what, be too late for this year, but yeah. Um, what essentially I was looking into was a one amount on a backhoe, right? Um, that would have a belly dump that we could just dump in our own plow trucks and right. dispose of. So, hmm. and it's too late for this year, I would imagine, to be able to get equipment and. Yeah, well, I know there's a yeah, bit of a weight enough. on equipment, yeah, and, and that's fair. Most places that we've been in contact with are all first come, first serve. Um, some sp- places are like if we put a PO on a piece of equipment, you're guaranteed that price. But as I've been finding out, the prices just keep going up right. weekly. So. Okay. Thank you. So you sweep in the hamlet. Yes. And and down in Rutherglen Glen on. Park yeah, street area and around in there, and the main intersections like development, <coughs> that sort of thing. <coughs> so all like your main intersections, tar and chip, and then through the whole town being your hardtop services. Very good. And then park, sorry, parking lots as well. Moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, whereas two quotes were obtained from local contractors for street sweeping services. Therefore, that TZR be contacted for the purpose of street sweeping for a total cost of $6,800. All in favor? Carried. Is Donna gone? Donna. No, I'm here. My hand is raised. You just can't see it. Oh, <laughs> well, we can't see you. That's why. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's something drastically wrong with my camera. So um, okay. I'm not at a rave. <laughs> You're still there. Okay. <laughs> Next, we have the a report from our planning administrator, short-term rentals. Um, we had our town hall meeting, and at the town hall meeting, we brought it out to the public that this council would like to do something with short-term rentals, uh, whether that be uh, not do anything, uh, create bylaws, not create bylaws. Uh, we just want to open the discussion for the public. Uh, we did a survey with our community survey, which had four quick questions within the survey, which prompted another survey at our town hall meeting. Uh, we actually had a, about approximately 200 respondents in our in that survey that we conducted on the, at the town hall meeting as well as putting it on the website, uh, which was uh, pretty astounding for the township of Bonfield to have that many people answer. <coughs> uh, 39 responses in that survey were from rental owners, while 208 answers were from the general community. Overwhelmingly, the uh, community agreed that the township should allow short-term rentals and with regulations. And I put a summary in the report below that uh, most people didn't want to restrict which type of services they were getting, whether they were on a, uh, a municipally maintained road or a <laughs> road. Uh, they didn't want to regulate if there was people living on the premises for the short-term rental, the owner. Uh, that didn't want to regulate any demerit system or, or number of rental nights or a lot, and they would like us not to regulate that there would be in non-occupiable dwellings. It's a pretty hefty report, so I apologize. Sure. <laughs> um, we did discuss at the town hall meeting the statistics in Bonfield that there are 34 advertised short-term rentals through various websites like Airbnb and Verbo. Uh, 71% of those are located on the waterfront, which mostly for us is in the residential limited services zone. Uh, if we had a family of four staying in a short-term rental, it would equate to approximately 136 visitors. So short-term rentals are uh, a very good proponent for tourism within our municipality. Um, using the rental figures provided in the 34 advertisements at four nights per stay resulted in 1.9 million per annum industry in Bonfield. And that doesn't include any residual spending from the visitors that are in the municipality. Uh, we reviewed the survey and we could see that there was some discrepancies in the survey. Uh, for instance, one IP address answered the survey 18 times. Um, the survey before, we only allowed one person per IP address. 
and it was voice that we didn't allow two people that may own a home answer. So we opened it that way, or we cannot prohibit the 18 people answering the survey as one person. Um, we formed the questions that were in the survey by reviewing other bylaws and policies and other municipalities that are considered around the same size as ours. Other municipalities have created licensing and bylaws for short-term rentals because they provide clarity and consistency by defining roles, responsibilities, and procedures. Bylaws help prevent misunderstandings and conflicts among the community. Bylaws provide transparency and accountability for decision-making, and bylaws establish a framework for decision-making, determine the rights and responsibilities of the ratepayers, and ensure fair, consistent governance. By having bylaws, it would help us have responsible ownership. It would maintain the character of our neighborhoods, as well as would allow our the owners to know how we expect them to react. It would allow the neighbor to know how to issue complaints. It would allow the owner to know how we're going to deal with complaints if the council decides to go with a bylaw or regulation. We have, uh, if we do not, decide to license or create a bylaw. Other municipalities have decided not to because they did not have the staffing resources to allow for inspections or enforcement of the bylaw. Other bylaws and legislation regarding the conduct of renters are in place to regular, regulate behavior of the renter, just as well as we regulate our uh, citizens and our municipality when it comes to noise bylaws, open air burning bylaws, uh, building requirements under the code. The cost for enforcement for some municipalities may, may not be financially viable. The municipality may feel that there is a need to preserve the housing market due to the number of short-term rentals. Therefore, they do not regulate them or permit them at all. There is also an air of wait to see as the provincial and federal governments have been tackling this issue directly. Uh, British Columbia and Quebec have already tabled legislation for private province-wide policy, and the federal government is actively reviewing SDR rules to mandate affordable housing. Lessons learned from other municipalities. We discussed the uh, case law for the township of Plus Lynch, uh, where it was uh, recognized that the municipality tried to govern how the use of the property was. However, when you rent uh, a home, the use is the same for the renter as it is the owner, so that they felt that the, the courts felt that they were trying, the municipality was trying to regulate the user and not the use of the property. Uh, after investigating a staff report with the township of Tiny, Tiny had decided to allow for only 300 licenses to, become, to come on a first serve basis. The building inspection was part of the requirement of the licensing. After all the building inspections were completed, the township discovered that there was 200 infractions <coughs> and, had, and all those infractions had to be remedied before any licenses could be issued. There, they also found that over 20 decks were built without permits. There was extra washrooms without permitting. There was extra bedrooms. <laughs> Are you okay? No, I, I'm <clears throat> sorry. I don't. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were getting up to go sit in the clerk. Okay, then. I'll take over. Yeah. Not, not just an IT guy. Yeah? No, I think I'm going to. I'll keep my notes here, so we're good. Yeah. Um, the county of Halliburton implement, implemented where uh, they decided to come up with a registration bylaw. So they had all the, the short term rentals register, and they waited for one year so they could collect the data that they could get from the registration. And then they were able to determine how much income they could generate from those registrations. And then they hired a third party to, to uh, enforce all their bylaws and all the regulations that they set forth with their short-term rentals. The advantages and disadvantages of short-term rental regulations. During the research into short-term rentals, we have reviewed over 20 municipal bylaws and spoke to other municipal staff to gauge the intent and success of the bylaws that have been implemented and have attended workshop sessions. 
This has provided sound knowledge on how short-term rentals have affected other communities. And as you can see, there's still a lot of contentious conversation with Wes Nipissing, one of our neighbors. There's disadvantages and advantages to having specific bylaws in place to regulate short-term rentals. There's a lack of oversight without clear regulations, uh, neighborhood disruptions, housing availabilities in areas with high demand for housing with unregulated short-term rentals. There's uneven competition with unregulated short-term rentals, unfairly competing with hotels and motels. And there's legal uncertainty when guests and hosts face legal uncertainties regarding their rights and responsibilities. Advantages to having regulations uh, is income generating. So short-term rentals will provide additional income stream for the property owner. This can be especially beneficial for individuals who rely on rental income to cover expenses. Uh, it actually cre creates higher housing values in certain areas of the township. And it provides a greater choice for travelers who enjoy a wide range of accommodation. Local experiences get to be experienced by accommodation in a municipality such as ours that has limited accommodation. And it is effective use of space. So if someone has an extra bedroom in their home and they wish to use that for accommodation for short-term rentals, and it provides them also with extra generated income. And it is a great support for our local tourism and economy. The options for council is to allow short-term rentals to continue without regulation or licensing, taking no action. Uh, the potential consequences is uh, we could strengthen the bylaws that we do have to address the services resulting from the occupancy occupants. Unknown budget increase for OPP callouts, pay per call. How do we ensure consumer protection? How do we ensure the health and safety of the occupant? How does the township recoup added users to infrastructure and services without affecting the entirety of the ratepayer? What mechanisms would be in place to prevent waterfront property being owned for the sole purpose of short-term accommodation? <clears throat> what mechanisms are available to local residents to ensure affordable housing remains available? How do we ensure environmental protection on waterfront with increased septic use? How do we maintain the character of our neighborhood? Uh, there's no consequence for operators when bylaws are broken, such as the noise bylaw. Uh, for instance, like if someone goes to a motel, there's uh, management on staff that evening that would address if there was noise issues within the motel. It usually doesn't result in an OPP phone call. Um, without, uh, without doing anything, there's a lack of direction and guidance for the staff, the, the neighbors, as well as the owners. To ban short-term rentals in their entirety, entirety would be a loss of support for tourism economy in our township. There would be no accommodation for visitors, loss of revenues to create affordability for the property owner. Bond filled would not be a choice for a visitor. While enforcement costs to enforce a regula another regulatory ban unknown. No marketability for the township of bond field and branding. Neighborhoods gain back their feeling of security and character and there would be no impact on the housing market. To allow short-term rentals to continue with license and regulation, the potential consequences would be extra cost to the owner operator for licenses and inspection, a feeling of over-governance of their, of their property, maintain character of the neighborhood, to provide safety for the user, uh, current lack of legislation for short-term rentals, as we just discussed, hotels, motels, must all legislation as accommodation sector of gas, fire safety, innkeepers act, sanitary regulations, occupier liabilities act. These acts protect the consumer and provide health and safety regulations. Uh, it would also help uh, protect the short-term rental owners as there are no residential, the residential tenancy act, if they could get in trouble by a uh, visitor overstaying their welcome, then they'll fall underneath the, res the Tenancy Act instead of under the short-term regulations that are not provided to us by the province. A regulation would provide guidance for the owner, the occupier, neighborhood would have ex expectations, as well as provide transparency for the council and the staff. So the code of conduct for the occupier will provide direction on what the expected behavior of a municipality is. 
allows the municipality to maintain economic prosperity and ensures responsible ownership. It would provide data for the township for basing decisions and bylaw enforcement costs. Other re regulation are currently still unknown and provide revenue for the enforcement of that regulation. Uh, I guess that would be the, my long-winded <laughs> conversation <laughs> for this evening. And that, like I said, back to the survey with all the respondents answering the survey, they would like to see regulation in the short-term rental industry. They would like <laughs> to see it permitted the next questions, I guess, would be for council to determine what the bylaw would look like. So <laughs> we have a motion, but in moving the motion is just asking for a draft bylaw. And I would like that opportunity to certainly to go over it before I would consider being in favor one way or the other. I don't know about council, mm -hmm. if you're feeling the same. Is it possible to defer this to corporate services perhaps so that we can maybe talk more specifically about what we want to see in a bylaw? Uh, just based as well, I know that um, other members of council, I know I have, I've read uh, a lot of the other <clears throat> bylaws in neighboring municipalities and there's some really good things in there that uh, you know at least we're not reinventing the wheel we're starting from scratch there's a lot of things that we can pull uh, from from various documents so you would like us not to prepare a draft file and just to yes. discuss that our corporate meeting I think it might be difficult to prepare a bylaw, not maybe knowing exactly what we would like to see in the bylaw. So it might be helpful for staff if we um, uh, noted a few things or even had discussions amongst ourselves as to what we think it should look like. Um, you know, there may be difference of opinions just between council. So um, if we could get consensus on uh, you know, just what kind of regulations and where we think are, what might be unique for our municipality or, you know, where we think our, our challenges are um, and what we want to focus on. It may be different than uh, some of the other municipalities. Uh, I concur with uh, Councilor Clark to defer it. I think it's going to be worth the, the conversation for context. Uh, from you know just gathering some some thoughts and and building some ideas uh, obviously uh, from my perspective and the information I've gathered is is what we're going to have to try and do uh, is to come up with a solution that's going to really limit those that are coming to our municipality buying a piece of property really without the intention of utilizing it or being here and are just using it as a hotel motel uh, that is really what the, you know, I'm focused on it. This is, a, we all heard in the town hall, the passionate uh, voices that, you know, what we're not trying to do is get in the way of, you know, a responsible homeowner who's trying to run a short-term rental. Uh, that is, that is fine. I mean, we have to put some structure and some uh, regulations around it, but it's not in any way, from my opinion, to impede them from doing that. It's to make sure that the people that are not being responsible homeowners or landowners are going to treat that property and take it as seriously as those that are living within our municipality that we're at that town hall to make sure that we're uh, that we're structuring in that way. Uh, and my last point is, uh, I had the opportunity last week, I think I lose track of time. Uh, it was in the media, but if council hasn't had the opportunity, council clerk, I think you have uh, to read the West Nipissing bylaw. The that just came out, West Nipissing, uh, I'll compliment West Nipissing and just say, uh, you can tell that they've spent a lot of time uh, on their bylaw. It's actually very well written. Uh, I think that would be a, a nice starting spot to bounce conversation to jumping off spot, so. Very good. Yeah, I agree. We need to have more of a conversation between council and figure out where we're gonna go with it. Very good. The report was very good. Very yeah, well yeah, done yeah. Well because done. it gave us a lot to think about one way or the other. So having said that, I, I still would like, I would like to have more information and know more about it. 
I think that uh, perhaps for the corporate services meeting, I'll just bring uh, forward, um, I've already prepared all the authority that the council has to direct a bylaw. I can bring that just to show what authority you do have. That way you also can, that also helps build the, the bylaw itself. So the, our next meeting is Thursday night, am I right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> in two days from now. <laughs> Tomorrow is Wednesday. You get a, you get a day off. <laughs> uh, perhaps for the May meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So can we discuss timelines though? Because I know some public are thinking that we're trying to put this into place for this year. And I think that's obviously our goal, but looking at it now and, and trying to get it right. And then are we looking at more public consultation? Um, like we still have to hire um, bylaw officer or there's no point in having this bylaw finished. So what what's the grand look like right now for, for a timeline? Like when do we think we can feasibly put this into place? if we're looking at licensing and things like that. So the next corporate services meeting would be the first or second week of May. Right. We can talk about it on Thursday night. Um, and then, but between now and then, if everybody could um, review the West Nipissing bylaw and we could, in the agenda package, we'll have our, the draft bylaw with all of the authorities that council has permitted. Yep. Then we could have a discussion on May, have a special meeting if we need to. Um, and it could certainly be in place for July. Uh, so depending on how <coughs> council decides to address the bylaw, whether it's through a licensing authority or through the zoning bylaw, that will depend on the public consultation. So we've done four public consultations now on short-term rentals. Um, and council actually, you have the option of doing another one once you have, I would recommend when you have the bylaw because there's no new information until you have a draft bylaw. So right. you could do another public consultation based on the on the draft bylaw. Okay. But, and that could be the beginning of June and still have this in place for, for July. So not for, uh, and to do a draft bylaw now, we would have more discussions about it. And then we, then we would just do a recommendation to bring a draft bylaw forward. I think the way that the motion is worded in this is just that staff can do a draft bylaw. And that is, you know, pointing out that there's a decision that yes, council wants to look at having draft bylaw for regulation. So even if you, you read the motion and then you, instead of carry, you defer it and then we can talk about it at a corporate services meeting. So it's still making the decision that you do want to look at a bylaw with regulations. Yeah. Yeah. I. I don't know. I I think that I would like to look at a draft bylaw, and what what are you looking at? You put a lot of information in here. Where are you going with it? What you you need our direction in the end, but we're we're going by the information that you have collected and what you're giving to us. So I I would like to look at something just to see what it looks like. Where, where are we going with this so we can separate the information that we have? But if you guys want to wait and and go over it and then do a, the draft bylaw. Um, if I could, I would just say the, the thing that helped me the most in trying to figure is, was reading in detail uh, the West Nipissing bylaw. I'm sure there's a million other bylaws like I've seen that you've referenced some in here, uh, but that was the most it made local media. So I had clicked on the link and went to the West Nipsing Township website. And that helped quite a bit. Like it is for me, I think if we were to actually look at that and even started going, came in and like, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Like we all did a bit of a homework before we come into that. Be like, I like the whole bylaw or uh, this section I would change to whatever. That might be a great starting spot to get a draft bylaw very, very quickly done. Yeah, I've, um, I've read about six of them uh, from various municipalities already. Um, and uh, I mean, there there's a lot of similarities, but I think, again, if we if we look at and I, I believe you're right, West Nipissing is the one that I one most recently read into, I think really 
uh, fits the, you know, the fabric of our municipality. It's got, it, it addresses some of the concerns that we are looking at. Um, and uh, so that the wording, it's very well written. It really is. Uh, but there are other things in other municipalities too. We are not, you know, like a, a Prince Edward County type um, place where uh, there's uh, vineyards. I mean, we do definitely have tourists, but it's not, uh, you know, there's different um, people wrote their bylaw to address the concerns specific to their community. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, I think if we, um, got our ideas from an existing bylaw, it would be helpful. I could send out a few links to bylaws for the council to review in, in their time that they have. Um, and then that way, when we do have our meeting, we could discuss what you liked on other ones, not liked on others. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could start at that at the basic starting point to move forward um i know i'm just trying to keep in mind like the responsible ownership yep. uh, yeah. how do we make conduct yeah 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 i i think if you were to provide us a couple of examples including the west nipissing one if you could say right. that uh if council did their homework and came well read from other bylaws and just kind of with their ideas that would very quickly Give you a bylaw. Yeah, give us a bylaw, right? Yes. So, like, I just feel timeline wise, this was on our radar since we've been elected for sure. Um, I'm not saying that we should defer any longer. I'm just saying if I ran an Airbnb, obviously, right now I'm trying to fill my summer and get deposits for weekends and things like that. So, we just need to be conscious of that moving forward that if we put a bylaw in, how are we rolling that out? We need to be fair to people that rely on this currently for a source of income and, and for a business because we're kind of right in the middle of our busy season, but it, right? Is it really a business? I mean, it's not even like... I think some would be, yeah, for sure. I am. Um, uh, if you, when you read the West Nipissing, you're going to see that they actually talk a bit about how to transition, like even in their bylaw, how do you deal with the ones that are currently operating within the municipality versus what moving forward, right? So some okay. people get grandfathered in and obviously to CA O'Kunkel's point, or sorry, maybe it was uh, uh, our planning administrator's <laughs> point, um, it was if... Um, uh, I don't know. I can't even remember the point I was going to make. It was. Uh, is yeah. it? I like. I, I teed off. Like, is it really a business? And you're kind of saying how yeah. it trends. Well, it's about implementation. I think implementing the program. Right. I don't know. It's, it's escaped me. I'm sure it'll come back to me as soon as you want to move on to another subject. I'll be like, oh, your worship, I remember. <laughs> Do you remember? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it was a point that was made earlier. So if you if you feel free there. just to top me and I'll let you Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh so the bottom line is are you doing a draft bylaw or no? It seems as though yes, council is interested in a bylaw, but they want to be at, at corporate services have a better discussion on what the, the regulations will be in the bylaw. Okay. So you can defer the motion to the corporate services. Defer it and we'll bring it to corporate services. In May. In May. Okay. And could I just add that in there? Yes. While she's finding the meeting may be May 2nd, which is the council meeting is April 30th, and then it would be that Thursday. I think for NOM is the next week. So we can confirm on Thursday, but kind of keep the, the next second. corporate services meeting. Okay, I'll read that. Moved by Councillor McGinnis, second by Councillor Featherstone. Whereas a staff report was provided to council regarding short term rentals and the survey results from the community survey and the town hall survey for information purposes has been presented 
Therefore, council directs the planning administrator to prepare a draft bylaw based on the responses from the survey results from the community in favor of permitting short-term rental with regulations and further that we refer this to corporate services for discussion. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Next we have hmm, a further report from the planning administrator. Taylor, trailers and recreational vehicles on vacant land. Uh, thank you. Lisa shorter. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> um, it's a lot shorter because there's a lot less unknowns when it comes to the trailers. Short-term rentals are so new and like exploding where the trailers have been dealt with practically the same in most of Northern Ontario. Uh, it was never permitted in most areas because it's not an, um, an accessible building uh, should not be used for habitat. Uh, so most areas never, ever, ever allowed for a trailer to be used on property that is vacant land. Um, however, with uh, COVID and the increased cost of waterfront property, there seems to be like, you couldn't even buy a trailer two summers ago. There were none to purchase. That's how many people were buying trailers. And with the cost of owning waterfront property, it was trending that a trailer would pop up on vacant waterfront property. Uh, many townships around us also are considering bylaws uh, and amendments to their zoning bylaws by either permitting trailers on vacant land, how they permit trailers on vacant land, and where they permit trailers on vacant land. Uh, the bylaws aim to strike a balance between the property rights and community interests. Uh, licensed trailers ensure that cottage owners who pay property taxes are treated fairly. It also helps maintain order and prevent overcrowding in rural areas. Uh, challenges and concerns are that citizens have expressed concern about the impact on their rights of property. For example, the proposed bylaw on Sable Spanish River sets a minimum lot size of two and a half acres potentially affecting existing trailer owners with smaller lots. Some opponents argue that such bylaws could be unconstitutional. However, the Township of Nipissing's bylaw was challenged in the Ontario Land Tribunal and was, and it was found that the municipality had the authority to exercise the bylaw. A bylaw is about balancing growth in a tax base where a township is aiming for growth to need to expand their tax bases by promoting uh, buildings of dwellings, practical and enforceable bylaws can achieve that while maintaining a fair balance between residential rights and community needs. <clears throat> um, my analysis is that the current, the current zoning bylaw regulates trailers and recreational vehicles and does not permit a trailer or recreational vehicle on any vacant land. Trailers are only permitted to be used on lands with a dwelling for 120 days. To better understand the community, the township conducted again a community survey with four, four questions. And we did once again bring that to our town hall meeting to discuss and create another survey that we posted to our website. <coughs> According to the survey results, there are currently 24 trailers on vacant land and only 50% of those trailers are hooked up to septic systems. However, that does not mean that the trailers are not being pumped out or they're not using other methods for gray water and septic, but it does raise a question for the environmental perspective. Most municipalities do not permit the use of trailers and RVs due to the lack of assessment value and the inability to appropriately tax property for the use of the services. They are not suitable for a primary residence. Health and safety reasons are concerned to prevent year-long residency in a trailer that is not meant for habitation, as most trailers and RVs do not fall under the building code. Environmental concerns regarding septic and gray water also do not fall under the building code for trailers and recreational vehicles, another reason why they were never permitted. Spending a summer in a trailer has become an affordable retreat for many people in Ontario's cottage country 
and trailers have grown in popularity and municipalities are looking for a way to better manage. Trying to find a balance between allow allowing trailer use and protecting the environment and not overstressing our services by adding more occupancy during the summer while protecting the aesthetics of our waterfront and protecting the health and safety of the user has been a contentious conversation for over several decades. Several municipalities in our region have been permitting trailers and recreational vehicles to use on vacant lands with a bylaw to ensure that they're not used for habitation and that environmental protection is in place concerning the septic and gray water and licensing is provided to capture reven revenue for the purpose of lack of utilizing township services. The township of Strong, French River, West Nipissing, Nipissing, to name a few, have regulated and licensed trailers and recreational vehicles. The questions in the survey were derived from using those bylaws. And the, the greatest example is that of Nipissing where it was challenged for the Ontario Lion Tribunal. Uh, once again, the, there was uh, a lack of confidence in the survey as 18 people also answered the survey <laughs> from the same, same IP. Uh, but recognizing that 88% of the respondents of the survey do not own a trailer on vacant land provides an interesting perspective of the community's opinion of those who were surveyed. Only 12% of those surveyed have a trailer on vac vacant land, indicating that most people who answer the survey have no gain by in participating in the survey and expressing their opinion. I love, uh, sorry, I didn't silent my phone. <laughs> And everyone can hear that it's my brother phoning. <laughs> yeah. There's a cat being caught by the tail in there. My mother. <laughs> I apologize. Who's that? <laughs> um, I did provide a short summary. Uh, so it was inconclusive if we should we had, should allow trailers with regulation. It also was inconclusive if we should allow them on the waterfront. Uh, we should uh, allow through regulation in hamlets and rural area. Uh, they do not, it was inconclusive if we should license them. Uh, there was consideration for permitting in a, for a group weekend only. Uh, for instance, if you're having a family reunion or a wedding, you may wish to have 20 trailers on your property to accommodate for so no one's drinking and driving. Uh, we talked about allowing accessory buildings, if we should allow more than one trailer per property and if they should be following the required setbacks. If we keep the zoning, the council option would be to keep the zoning as is and not to permit trailers on vacant land and to keep the zoning bylaw as it stands. The consequences would be, we would have to continue to enforce the zoning bylaw and remove all trailers from vacant lands. Uh, there would be missed opportunity for seasonal residency and vacant landowners and trailer owners would still feel overgoverned. Allowing trailers and recreational vehicles to be on vacant land with a license and regulation ensures proper management of septic and gray water, ensuring environmental protection and responsible ownership. It would provide regulation to ensure the health and safety of the user by regulating the habitation in the trailer or RV through seasonal limitations when permitted to be used. The ability to amend the zoning bylaw bylaw to the placement of trailers in certain zones to maintain character of our neighborhood. Uh, licensing provides revenue for services that are not being taxed due to no assessment. Regulation would provide clear guidance and transparency. Owners of vacant land feel overgoverned, and bylaws would also still need to be enforced. And that is the end of my report regarding the use of trailers and RVs on vacant land. Any questions? <laughs> Sorry, I, feel like I have too many questions. But uh, so the sort of community survey that uh, got 140 answers, that was the one that was done right in the early New Year? Um, when was that completed? The first one in the New Year was the community satisfaction survey. That one only had four questions. That one was the right. one that we did at the town hall. And for the um, for the residents who are at the town hall. And then we also had a lot of requests for it to be online. So we did do it through Survey Monkey as well and we had paper copies. So it is the second one that had the, the most. 
for yeah. 140 for the community survey and two an average of 200 per answer for the website and town hall. How do oh, for the website and town hall? Because when I look at the like an average of 200, mm -hmm. we had one question that got 201 responses. Oh, plus 56 non responses. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see how you yeah. are. So I, I, I broke down at the back the survey results uh, in the appendix. Okay. Uh, like, for instance, should the township allow trailers? 201 responses with 78% said yes, and 56 responses gave a 21.79% no. And are we able to see the IP addresses for the online? Yes. That's, and? However, just let the general population know that it's still uh, an anonymous survey. Like, we don't have the ability to figure out who lives where by IP address or anything to that effect. Have we considered the library's IP address? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah, I think that we oh. did look at. Yeah, yeah, we did. But you can kind of see the answers are all the same. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and a minute apart. Okay. <laughs> yes. And that's why we put the, the confidence level. If there was a difference in the yes and no answers, that's how we sure. determined if it was inconclusive or if it was an answer. Like there had to be a, a large margin between those two answers. Yeah. I, I'm going to be honest. I'm challenged by the responses and being guided by the, the responses we've received in the survey when I feel it's been skewed by this, either the sample size or uh, the cohort that was at either the, I mean, it's pretty easy to assemble a room of 50 people and very much skew a percentage of mm -hmm. survey responses on behalf of the municipality or on behalf of the community. So I, I, I'm challenged to rely strictly on guidance from these surveys because I tell you, like, it, this is not what I've heard from the public either, right? So what I'm hearing from the public varies quite a bit from kind of what I'm seeing in here. So um, I would hope that we would be, um, I, I guess the question should be, should we be deferring this one uh, to the next, to the same meeting that we had so that you can get a general sense as to what council is thinking? I mean, I think I'm a broken record and maybe you have all of our feedback at this point, but it's, you know, it doesn't make sense for me that they would continue to be on our, that we would have, trailers on vacant waterfront property that, or, uh, and I would be in favor of a setback, whether it's like I see in here, like a 2.5, somebody did a 2.5 acre uh, minimum piece of pro property. I'm, I'm less concerned about that, more of the setbacks, which I get is just a reverse engineering of how big the piece of property needs to be. But um, I think that there's, and, and not in the hamlets. So I don't know where the rest of council spends on that, but you know, that is, we would want the ability to have that conversation before seeing a draft bylaw come forward, in my opinion. I could do the same scenario with the different bylaws from different municipalities and bring them forward to council to bring out what they may think or not think is appropriate. Um, uh, well, like I said, I would pay special attention to the Township of Nipissing's bylaw because it has already been challenged with the land tribunal and it, uh, came back and that it was, they're fine. Well, that one there, we could give, uh, we could, you know, corporate services, we could tell us, you know, kind of express what we're interested in and then, and then and, and yeah, can go ahead and make a bylaw, a draft or, you bylaw know, draft bylaw, bylaw then. Yeah. Yep. Okay, <clears throat> so same deal. Kind of. <laughs> without, the home, without the homework. Oh, I'm sorry, the timing was ju very early June for the, or very early, When's the next corporate service? May. 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 Perfect. Okay. May is great. Wait, we can so on the actual day. Yeah. And I do understand if I may, like between the two surveys, short-term rentals, those surveys came back with a very definitive answer. Trailers came back with a very inconclusive answer that our community is still very divided on the trailer issue. So it will be a challenge to present something that will make the majority of the township. Right, I think uh, the short term, it's just that survey, it's just who was there more passionate. Yeah. Um, but it was online as well, right? right? So it could. There's always a silent majority that are is not passionate about it, or quite frankly, the bylaw as it reads right now is trailers aren't allowed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, somebody who's not in favor of trailers being on vacant property is probably less likely to 
try and skew the numbers as opposed to somebody who's very much in favor, right? So that's, it's the challenge that I have with the survey versus here's a draft bylaw, let's take the feedback. Do we actually agree with the feedback or the concerns brought forward by, and then and then we stand by our decision, is, right? Right, is this, that's gonna be brought to a town hall again right. or, or a public consultation? Public, public consultation, So yeah. I mean, make a draft bylaw and see who comes out and- We could be, we do a survey monkey as well where it would only be one opinion per household. Right, mm -hmm. right. And we need to advertise the heck out of it because again, if we're gonna allow this to because people obviously that are very passionate maybe have a trailer on a piece of property now obviously have a vested interest in a conversation that's ongoing somebody who doesn't have a dog in that fight is probably far less likely to engage in the survey but might still have an opinion that if we make the change to allow it to happen all of a sudden we're now going to hear from them to be like wait a minute why would you have done that right mm -hmm. that's that's the skewing that can happen so are we asking for a bylaw for Thursday night? A draft bylaw? Or are we deferring that? I bylaw? think we defer. Okay. I would ask for a deferral. I'm going to read the motion. Sure. Moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone. Whereas the survey results from the community indicate that there is a desire to allow trailers and recreational vehicles on vacant land through the use of licensing and regulation. Therefore, council directs the planning administrator to draft a bylaw with licensing provisions to be reviewed by council. All in favor or defer? De defer, I think, can we, would we be able to add kind of the same language that you did for it to come to corporate services? Okay. Uh, and refer. A defer, I guess. No, refer. And refer this to corporate services for discussion. Now that's carried, but we're asking her to do a draft bylaw to bring the information. But that will trigger for the draft bylaw to be after, right after the corporate services conversation. That this provides the ability to draft that draft. Right? That's okay. yes. Okay. That's how I understand it. Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Carried. Donna. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she sleeps in there. Yeah, yeah. No one can see her. No, I'm awake. Okay. So now we have adoption of committee minutes and motions, the corporate services committee meeting, no minutes. That'll be Thursday night. Emergency services <coughs> committee, no minutes for this session. Planning advisory committee, no minutes for this session. Recreation Committee, no minutes for this session. Police Services Board, no minutes for this session. Then we'll move on for items for discussion. In case we haven't had enough discussion yet. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. have next. <clears throat> we have resolutions to adopt a bylaw. I guess I'll pass. I'll go over the motions and then we'll see. <clears throat> so the first one is uh, to appoint an integrity commissioner. Whoops, did we miss one? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. Hmm. I, see what you're I think I had an extra page put in there. Oh, we're missing the page, actually. We start at 8F. Oops. Oh, there we go. I skipped it. That's why. There. <clears throat> Moved by Councillor McGinnis, sex by Councillor Featherstone, that the Council for the Township of Bonfield hereby adopts bylaw 2024 17 
being a bylaw to appoint an integrity commissioner for the township of Bonfield as presented and is considered read three times and passed this ninth day of April, 2024. All in favor? Donna? Yes. All in favor? Yes. Carried. Carried. Next, we have resolution to adopt bylaw 2024-18 to adopt a site plan control. Resolution number eight, moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, that the Council for the Township of Bonfield hereby adopts bylaw 2024-18, being a bylaw to adopt a site plan control for the Township of Bonfield as presented and is considered read three times and passed this ninth day of April, 2024. All in favor? Yes. Okay, thanks, Donna. Next we have uh, resolution for first and second reading of bylaw 24-19, moved by Councillor McGinnis, second by Councillor Featherstone, that a bylaw to adopt user fees for the Mount Pleasant Cemetery be read a first and second time in open council this ninth day of April, 2024. All in favor? Just mentioning that, uh, and with your um, with your suggestion a few months ago about the the columbarium out there, I've had lots of people asking me about that. If that's any, ever anything we see here, so I guess that's something that. Uh, Maybe uh, Nick, we could we could get somebody to look into that to see if there's any possibility and what the cost would be. Okay. Uh, next we have fees for recreation and programming. A resolution for first and second reading of bylaw twenty twenty four dash twenty fees for recreation and programming that a bylaw to adopt user fees for the recreation and programming fees be read a first and second time in open council this ninth day of April, 2024. Mm. Any questions? I have a question. Um, if people just want to use the park, say for pictures or a picnic or anything like that, do they, are there fees for that? No. no. Just when they want space private, just for them, and they want it to be organized and, and private. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Karen? Professional pictures, wedding pictures. When you say you can't come on the island, then you pay. Mm. Yeah. Long as you chase the geese. <laughs> <laughs> Not at the beach. <laughs> Next, we have um, moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, that a bylaw to adopt user fees for administration fees charged be read a first and second time in open council this ninth day of April 2024. All in favor? Carried. Next, we have a resolution moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, that a bylaw to adopt user fees for the building department fees charged be read a first and second time in open council meeting this ninth day of April 2024. All in favor? Donna? Yes. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, that a bylaw to adopt user fees for environmental and landfill fees be read a first and second time in open council this ninth day of April, 2024. I have questions. You have a question? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, on the trucks that are coming in, the 
single axles, tandem triaxles. We kind of ran into this a little while ago. Like, is there a difference between commercial rates or private citizens that have these vehicles? Currently, no. They these are the same. Mm. Yeah, just because uh, remember we ran in this a little while ago. Yeah. So it's kind of I don't want to get back into that conversation. Seems unlike you. <laughs> so would you like would you like there to be a charge a difference between commercial? Yeah, I think if it's commercial, it should be more more. Mm -hmm. We can change that for third reading. Yeah, I mean, it's just small, but we kind of, it's a small thing, but we kind of ran into this already, so. Based on the fees that we do have, do you have any recommendations? No, I mean. Then we can investigate that. Investigate it, I mean, I don't know. And like, are these loads, uh, like what are the, are these, Try like say a triaxle load. Are we talking just fill? Are we talking demolition? Is there? Do we determine between the two? Distinguish between the two? Not as of late as all it is right now. Like we could come up with like categorize every single thing. Well, I don't think it. But yeah, you know, I understand what you're saying though. That like as you know, there's a big difference with a load of dirt and a load of Right, demolition or construction materials or concrete or something along those lines, right? So now, are we asking when you bring? Are we asking for this? Like, say demolition. Are we asking if to be separated, like clean, like no concrete in with demolition debris, like housing, like wood? And since I've been here, like we haven't had anybody dumping like that yet. Um, the issue hasn't arose. But I, I like, it's yeah, something. I think that should be something right. that's touched on. Right. I believe it does. There is wording in there that does say that it needs to be sorted. And there's also a 10% material handling if you have to do anything with that. But there is a section in there that they have to be sorted. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, number 16 is unsorted commercial loans. There's an additional charge if they're unsorted. And then five and six do touch on commercial, but are you looking at a different commercial? Um, well, again, it's uh, commercial. Those are trailers, right? They're not uh, trucks. Okay. You're going to have more commercial trucks than you are commercial trailers. Okay. That want to dump. Yeah. Like I said, I just think we should establish commercial is this rate. Don't matter. It doesn't matter how big, but how many axles you have. Okay. I mean, yes, single axle. Uh, tandem and triaxles matter, but if it's commercial, you're being charged this at a certain rate over a non commercial single axle truck. So we could add a fee in it just as it's 10% more, it's 20% sure. more than the current yeah. fee. So we'll investigate to see what other municipalities do. Okay. Bring something back. Okay. All in favor? Carried. Next we have um, moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, that a bylaw to adopt user fees for public works operations be read a first and second time in open council this ninth day of April, 2024. All in favor? Uh, do you have a question or are you nope, in favor? Okay. Thanks, sir. Donna? Yes. Okay. I'm in favor. <laughs> Next, we have moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, that a bylaw to adopt user fees for fire department fees be read a first and second time in open council this ninth day of April, 2024. All in favor? Carried. 
moved by Councillor McGuinness, second by Councillor Featherstone, that a bylaw to adopt user fees for planning matters be read a first and second time in open council this ninth day of April, 2024. All in favor, carried. Next, we have resolutions to be considered for adoption. Mm. This is a town of Amarant, operational budget funding. Moved by Councillor McGinnis, seconded by Councillor Featherstone, that the Council for the Township of Blondfield supports the Township of Amarant, calling on the province to treat all municipalities fairly and provide equivalent representative operational budget funding amounts to all Ontario municipalities. All in favor? Carried. And we have correspondence. I'm wondering, um, I'll just quickly go over them and ask uh, if you wanted support or to support. Uh, first of all, we have to uh, receive the quant correspondence moved by Councillor McGinnis, second by Councillor Featherstone, that Council receives the correspondence circulated with the agenda of April 9th, 2024. All in favor? Carry. Um, um, would we just mark on this so that on the, the list that I have, so you know that we're what we're referring for support. Yeah, yeah, and I have the motion. Here. Oh, you have it. Oh, okay. Don't have to worry then. The town of Whitby, Ontario Energy's board decision to end the gas pipeline subsidy. I no. don't agree. I, no, I don't. You I don't? don't. I'm not supporting that. No support. No. Uh. Township of Clearview endorsement of Bill C-63 in the House of Commons. Support that one. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's hard not to say yes to it, but yeah, I mean, it's... for that one. Yeah, yeah for sure. And uh, the town of uh, Shelburne uh, to eradicate Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Absolutely. I don't yeah. know how much it applies to our municipality, but, but I mean, 100%. it's covered so many other places. Like, yeah. But. I don't know. Uh, given the recent uh, <laughs> activity, uh, that's a fair point. Yeah. City of Brantford home heating sustainability. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Support. Yeah. Get that one. And the next one is uh, Bonfield Event Park. It's just a list of their dates. Um, so so what, are, what are rain dates? Like, you know, why do we have these dates booked if they're just rain dates? They're only, they're the dates if something, that if one of those other schedules, but rains on those scheduled days, this is the rain date for that event. Because she has to inform council for the bylaws, she has to, the event park has to inform council of any dates that they are going to have activity at the park for racing. So she's making sure that she, you are also aware that if this day, this scheduled event on May 24th is rained out, that event will happen on June 21st. So it complies with the bylaw. And do we have um, any information back about uh, uh, the, um... Uh, other safety issues there? We were uh, doing a plan not, together, an emergency plan? I do not have an emergency plan response yet, no. The, it's just information, anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just information. Um, next, we have information on North Bay Mattawa Conservation Authority. That's the minutes on the, at the meeting. 
and no closed session, no closed session, and the confirmatory bylaw. Moved by Councillor McGinnis, second by Councillor Featherstone, that the Council for the Township of Bonfield hereby adopts bylaw 2024-16 to confirm the proceedings of Council from March 26, 2024 to April 9, 2024 as presented and is considered read three times and passed this ninth day of April, 2024. All in favor? Carried. What yes. time is it? 8.30. 830. Next, we have the adjournment. Moved by Councillor McGinnis, second by Councillor Featherstone, that this meeting be adjourned at 8.30 p.m. All in favor? Carried. Good evening, everyone. Close the meeting. Good night. Good night.